There's perhaps no subject that so divides us, causes such great conflict in our nation than the subject of abortion. Abortion is of epidemic proportions. 4,000 babies a day are being killed in the mother's womb in the nation called America. On the program tonight, you're gonna to hear a couple of stories from two women who face the dilemma of an abortion, one who had two abortions and one who was told by her doctors that her newborn son should be left to die. My prayer is that as you hear this, you will think of someone that needs to know the truth about abortion. A baby, an unborn baby, is a human being. It's a person. That baby already has life, as you will see and hear tonight. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Tony Scott from the church on Strayer, and this is Life by Design. Joining me tonight is Nancy Newman, and I have known Nancy since the middle 1980s. And I well remember the day that we met. She and her husband came to the office at the church uh, to have a discussion about the issue of abortion. Nancy, thank you for being willing to come tonight and just share your story so that perhaps there's going to be a mother listening who's gone through what you've gone through, and maybe you will say something that will touch that mother's heart because I know that for you, this was a very difficult period of time. You had an abortion. Uh, the psychological effects of it, the damage of it to your own faith was more than you could handle. I'm going to turn to you now and let you share some of your story. Okay. Um, you know, I'd had my first sexual experience. I can't even remember now. It would have been 16 or 17 years of age. Um, I hung around with a couple girls that were sexually active and they talked a lot about it and I kind of felt like there was something I was missing out on, and so I, I uh, met a guy that I worked with, and we became sexually active, and honestly, it sounds ridiculous. I really didn't put a lot of thought into the fact that I might get pregnant. I don't even remember thinking about, thinking about it at all or being concerned. Um, I have very little recollection of even my relationship with the guy, and I thought I loved him. Um, but there's so many things that you block when that happens. Um, so at the time that I found out I was pregnant, I didn't even know what was going on in my own body. And I talked to my boss at my job and I told her what I was feeling. And she said, I think you're pregnant. Sure enough, I found out I was pregnant. Um, I just kind of, without even thinking, she helped me call a place and I, I went in, it was a clinic. I went in and had an abortion and I don't really remember thinking that much about it after that. I just blocked it. I was raised in a family. I knew it was wrong. I was, was raised as a Catholic. That's definitely against the Catholic religion. Um, I knew it was wrong, but I knew I did not want to start out life with a child that was conceived in the situation it was conceived in. So I had the abortion. Um, they put me on the pill at the time of the abortion. Um, I, I stayed on the pill for a long time. Um, I actually ended up meeting the man that is now my husband. And for whatever reason, I decided to get off the pill. And I got pregnant within the first few months of our relationship. And I had another abortion. For my first abortion, they told me, they said, this is not a fetus. This is a little flap of skin with a seed in the middle. And honestly, back then we didn't have Googling and computers. I didn't go on and figure out if they were being honest. I just knew that it was about the size of a quarter with a seed in the middle. And I never learned anything beyond that. And when I had the second abortion, and I was 11 weeks along for the first one and 12 weeks along for the second one. And I went through years just believing that that's what it was. And you don't wanna learn you don't want to learn anything beyond that because it's your saving grace. It's what's saving you from realizing what you've done. And it wasn't until my daughter was born, uh, my husband, 
the second abortion. We ended up getting married in 1985. And our first child was born in 1990. And she was born with a pretty severe heart defect. So we were taken to another hospital by ambulance. And the doctor came in the room. And the first thing he said was, Mom, I know you're thinking this is your fault. But there's nothing you did to cause this heart defect. This baby's heart was formed at six weeks gestation. And there's nothing you would have done differently. So in 1990 was the first time I realized that those two babies had hearts, beating hearts, and possibly fingers and toes. But the doctors don't tell a woman that. And as much as I can only blame myself, the doctors need to be honest with women, and they're not. So let's, let's if you can, just kind of think about what happened at that moment when, and even after the doctor left, and you begin to think about that first abortion and now the second one, and that baby had a beating heart. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that at 21 days, the baby has a beating heart. Mm -hmm. And at 45 days, the baby has brain waves. Mm -hmm. And as you said, immediately thereafter, there are all kinds of things going on, the sucking of the thumb, mm -hmm. uh, the feeling of pain, all of those things happen. So, so when you were told by this doctor, about the heart beating, what went through your mind? Oh, it was ugly. Okay. Um, because honestly, I, I, you, you don't think, you don't put it into perspective like that. And when he did that for me, he didn't even realize the wound that he was opening. Yes. And by that time, um, we had started going to the church on Strayer in about 1988, and I had some time in 1988-89 started having some emotional difficulty, and I had read a book and realized that my emotional difficulty had come from having these abortions, and that's when my husband said, we need to go talk to the, to the pastor at the church we're attending, and my first thought was, oh great, we're going to go and talk to this new pastor, and he's going to kick us out. He's going to tell us we don't need your kind, and he's going to send us on our way. And that's honestly what I thought. Um, and we came in, and, and you asked what we were there for, and I said, well, I've had two abortions. And instead of giving us our walking papers, you handed me the Bible, and um, you pointed to 2 Corinthians 5.17, and you said, read that. I said, therefore, in Christ we are a new creation. That is still my favorite verse to this day. All things have passed away and all things have and all become things new. all things have become new. And, and so I began a healing process at that point, even as much as I, I went to Bryan, Ohio and met at a crisis pregnancy center, went through some um, post-abortion counseling, and actually spoke at some anti-abortion, um, I don't want to call them rallies, um, but, uh, you know, I had done some speaking, and I had decided at that point that... And, you know, I told God, whatever I can do to take this and spin it around and help other women from either having an abortion or going through the pain and suffering, because I don't care what anyone says. I don't care what the abortion clinic says. I don't care what any of the counselors or the pol politicians or I don't care what any of them says. If you, if you as a woman have had an abortion at somewhere in your life, you are going to go through some emotional upheavals due to that. And after I met with you, I went through some healing. I realized that God was not holding it against me. I realized that I am loved by a loving God. And I knew that I would do whatever it took to make, to right this wrong. I remember us talking that day. It, 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 I don't even know why that's so indelibly imprinted on my mind, but I remember the meeting. I remember you crying and, uh, and Mark, your husband, crying as well. But I also remember after we settled the issue of the guilt that I told you that those babies were alive in heaven and that you would see those babies again, serve mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. When you leave this earth and you go to heaven, you're going to see those babies. Because in reality, what we do know is that life comes into the baby at conception. And that's so very important. 
It's argued all the time. It's argued by medical science. But now that we have sonogram, we have ultrasound, we, we have all these uh, medical devices and the education to use them and find out what's going on there. And quite interestingly, it has been recently discovered that at the moment the sperm meets the egg, in that woman's body, there is a flash of light. I have actually seen this on camera. It's, it's, it's the most amazing thing. And my personal belief is, if we go right back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, God said in the very beginning, let there be light. And so there is no life possible without light. Light is necessary for life. So here is the sperm eating the egg. Conception takes place and a brilliant light flashes at that moment. I personally believe with all of my heart, the soul comes in to the body at that time. Genesis chapter two and verse seven, when God created Adam and created him there in the garden, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. It was the life of God coming into him that caused him to be alive. And I believe that's what happens at conception. And I wanted to say that because I remember us discussing where the babies were and the fact that you would see them again, uh, that they were in heaven. Uh, they would be there when you get there. I remember that being a great comfort to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And now you have three beautiful children that mm -hmm. God has blessed you with, mm -hmm. two sons and a daughter. Mm -hmm. You now have two grandbabies. Mm -hmm. Tell me about those. Oh, geez. You only, you only have 30 seconds. <laughs> Tegan, <laughs> Tegan is um, just not quite three. She'll be three in May. And um, uh, Mia will, is 14 weeks. And I don't know what to say about them other than, you know, they say grandchildren are mother's reward for not killing your own children. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I love all my kids. And I'm thankful every day that God found me worthy to give me three more. Yes. who on top of it are giving me more because at one point in my life I felt like I would be forever judged and I would never have that blessing Yes. Um, because of what I had done. And now I know that not only do I have these children, but that I will see my other children someday, you know, someday in heaven. Yes, you will. My prayer is that there are going to be women watching who've gone through an abortion or who are contemplating an abortion. What would you say to them? What would you say to the mother who's had an abortion or to the woman who's about to have an abortion? You know, I just know for the woman that's had an abortion that there is forgiveness. There's no turning back. There's no looking back. But no matter what, that light that Pastor talks about, that soul, that spirit of God that's put into the child upon conception is what took that child to heaven. Uh, and... You have to forgive yourself. God has forgiven you. But then we have a hard time forgiving ourselves. And you've got to forgive yourself. And, and to the woman that's had an abortion, I don't know what else to say other than if that is what you're committed to do, go in, have an ultrasound, and see that child's beating heart before you make that decision. Because when you see that child's beating heart, you're going to realize but that is a baby in there. I know there are times when um, a woman will give birth to a baby, and let's just take the instance of a teenager, and maybe even a young teenager, who's made the mistakes that you made, has a baby, is not married, doesn't want to keep the baby. I don't think we talk about adoption enough. There are so many families, thousands of families in this nation, waiting on a child, would love to adopt a child. Know that God loves you. God cares about you. And just like with Nancy, there is forgiveness and there is healing. Jesus really does love you. Coming up next, we have the story of a young man, 15 years of age now. But right after he was born, the doctors suggested to his mother that they should perhaps take all the apparatus, the medical equipment that was basically keeping him alive for the moment, take it off and just let him die because of all the struggles he was having. 
You're not only going to hear this story, but you're going to hear from that young man. Imagine as a mother, you've just given birth to triplets. And having given birth to those triplets, obviously, we're talking about intensive care. We're talking about doctors and nurses hovering all around because three babies at one time is a lot. And especially if you're not that large to begin with. This mother was faced with a dilemma, the dilemma of possibly not letting one of those triplets continue to live because of great medical problems and struggles. And she had to make a tough decision. She and her husband, born-again believers, trusting God, leaning on God for his wisdom, prayed together, believed together, and made a choice, made a decision, knowing they would live with it for the rest of their lives. Joining me on the set is Kim Navrent and her son, Gabe. Thank you so much for joining me on the program. Kim, tell me about the moment. Well, let's go back a little bit beyond that. You're, you're carrying a, a triplets in your womb, and you're not a huge lady. You're a small build, and the doctor is saying what? I'm five foot three, so the doctors were really concerned. Could my body handle three babies? Was there enough room um, to handle three babies? So the first appointment we went to, and we had tried to have kids for years, so um, we were so excited to find out that we were having twins. And then we went back for another ultrasound a week later, and they said, oh my goodness, there's, there's three in there, there's triplets. Um, I was really scared to go for more ultrasounds after that. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to the first visit with the high-risk OB, and that doctor said, um, we need to present this option to you because we think it might be a good option for you that you selectively reduce. Um, and we said, well, what does selectively reduce mean? And they said, well, it means that we choose which baby we think might present the most trouble, and in this case, it would be the identical twins, and we inject potassium chloride into the heart of one of the babies, stopping their heart. Because they were so early on, that baby would reabsorb into your body and then you would continue the pregnancy with two. And we were just horrified. We thought, how can you ask us to make that kind of choice? How, do we, how would we pick which baby? That just wasn't even an option for us. And then we went on with the pregnancy and at the next visit we went to, a different doctor said, I want you to consider selective reduction. Um, and we said, no, we've already gone through this and we're not going to do that. So the, the whole pregnancy, you know, it was brought up to us numerous times and each time we rejected the idea. So, so Kim, when the babies are born and you have three, you don't have identical twins, you've got three. You've got three babies, two girls and a boy. And you name the boy Gabe, and Gabe is struggling. Gabe has some really critical medical issues, and the doctors tell you what? Gabe nearly died um, when he was just a few hours old. Um, they called us down to the NICU and said, you know, you need to come right now. We don't know if he's going to make it. And, um, and, he, and he did. And then on day three, they pulled us into a room, and they said, um, He's had a grade four brain hemorrhage, which means he had what they considered a catastrophic stroke. They said he will have no quality of life. He'll not walk, he'll not talk. And you should really consider whether you want to continue with life support um, because his quality of life will not be what you would hope. Now, the babies were born three months premature, so they were the smallest was one pound, 15 ounces, and the largest was two pounds, three ounces. So they were really tiny. Um, and when they said, you may want to consider removing life support, I felt like it was that moment when they first asked us to selectively reduce. They were asking us to make a decision about life and death. And we just felt like that's not our place. That's not, we said, you know, if God, if God takes him from us, then that's what we'll have to live with. But we're not going to do anything to actively cause his death, meaning remove life support. Um, and the doctor said, you know, we just want you to understand this is really bad. And we said, 
we have faith that God has a plan and we don't understand it right now, but we will. And so we chose to continue with life support and um, Gabe pulled through and he pulled through so many times when they would call us, they would call us at, um, they were born up at U of M at Mott Children's Hospital and they would call us at midnight and say, we're not really sure that this baby is going to make it through the night. And we'd rush up there and then they'd call and they'd say another baby isn't going to make it through the night. And, and this went on for a while. And um, eventually we got to a place where we realized they were all three going to live. And we realized what would have happened if we had listened. And we know that they were presenting us with what they believed to be medical certainty. They were presenting us with what they believed to be medical facts. And we just had to go on faith that God had a different plan and that God would reveal that plan to us in due time. And he did. So Gabe pulled through and he continued to get better and you eventually took all the babies home. And let's fast forward to where he's 10 years of age and he has uh, a growth on the side of his neck. I remember seeing that for the first yes. time. Yes. And you eventually find out that it's a very rare cancer. And once again, it's like 50-50. We we're just not sure. We'll treat him, but we're not sure. So a second time, his life is at stake. Yes. And that was, again, up at the University of Michigan. They believed he had a cyst. So they went in to take it out. And we had been told for over a year by doctors, it's just a lymph node. Don't worry about it. It's nothing to be concerned about. And we just kept pushing because it kept getting bigger and we were concerned. So U of M said, we'll take it out. They called us into the small room, um, the doctor, and he said, I have some really bad news and it is cancer. And we removed it, but we're not sure if we got it all. And I just remember, um, my husband says there's a theme whenever we've been pulled into a room telling us that Gabe's life was about to be taken. I rock back and forth saying over and over, he's okay, he's okay. And I remember doing that and thinking, God wouldn't have saved him when he was three days old to take him now. That can't be the plan. Um, and then we found out that the cancer had already metastasized to local nodes. And so he had to go back in and have another really major surgery. And then they told us that the recurrence rate for this kind of cancer is astronomically high once it has metastasized. So we ended up having to go get radiation so that we could um, prevent the further spread of cancer. And, you know, it's been five years and we're just continually blessed that God has a plan for Gabe's life. And that, and we believe that the devil comes after Gabe so hard because Gabe has so much to offer the kingdom and that Gabe's really going to impact people. We've always told Gabe, you know, you can be sad about the, um, the scars and the, the things that you have that are visible from your time with cancer, but you're going to be able to impact people in a way that no other 15 year old ever would because of what you've been through. So here he is. This is Mr. Gabe Navarrete, and he's 15 years of age now, five years now removed from the cancer surgery, 15 years removed from the time when the doctors didn't know if you'd be alive, and here you are. And I must say that I have watched the hand of God upon your life, seen the results of all the prayers that have gone on for you and covering you, and Gabe's a part of our youth ministry and has spoken in our youth ministry, has a powerful testimony, shares his faith at school. Uh, he's a regular evangelist, and I'm looking forward to the great things he's going to do. So Gabe, tell me how you have pulled through all these struggles. I guess I just realized that the devil was really trying to like knock me out. And because he saw something that was really damaging to him in me and that I would eventually use it for the kingdom. And he didn't like that. So he tried to wipe me out, but it didn't work. And I hold on to that. And I was reading uh, Revelation 2010 um, the other day and I was just like really thinking about it. And I was really just thanking God for that promise. 
Gabe, I've, I've watched you in action, and, and it's like when you grab hold of the mic and you begin to speak, there's a different Gabe that comes on the scene, and there's like fire in your eyes, and there's an authority in your voice. And I, I every time I see that, every time I watch God use you like that, I can't help but think about the times when the enemy, even when you were a baby, was going to take you out. With the cancer, he's going to take you out. And none of that worked. As a matter of fact, everything that you've come through has now prepared you for a kingdom ministry, which you already feel called to do. Tell me about that. How did you know that that calling was there? Um, well, I don't really know how to explain it, really. Um, I guess I kind of always knew that I was going to be used to, like, impact the kingdom and, like, my generation. And I was, um, I was like just listening to worship music, just praying, just like meditating on some scripture. And I heard, uh, God tell me like, I'm calling you into ministry. And I kind of like stopped for a second and I was like, wait, hang on, like, what are you doing? And then he said, I'm calling you into ministry. And I like started asking all these questions like, okay, like, where am I going to serve? What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? And, um, my plan is to um, go to Moody Bible College in Chicago and get a degree in biblical preaching so I can um, just use that along with my testimony to impact my generation. Well, I know God's going to use you greatly. I know that there's already a, a very strong anointing on your life. Kim, there are hopefully young women who perhaps have gone through an abortion or some who are contemplating. What would you tell them? The thing that has struck me through our experience is this, that you don't know what the plan is and everything feels scary in the moment. Everything feels um, overwhelming. And if you just are able to um, be quiet in the moment and listen for God's voice, and that's really what we had to do. Um, when you have medical professionals telling you what your child's future holds, um, it's really hard to focus and listen for God's voice. But if you can do that, if you can just listen for God's voice, he'll give you the answer. And um, God doesn't make mistakes. No, he doesn't. So our belief was God didn't make a mistake in creating three life, three lives in my body. Um, the doctors thought that was a mistake, but we believe that God doesn't make mistakes. So well, I want to thank you for coming in and being so open, sharing the story. Thank you, Gabe, as well, for coming and sharing. What we want to do is we want to send a message that there's healing, there is help, there's hope. Perhaps you've had an abortion. Maybe there's guilt. Maybe you're suffering from some emotional issues. We want to help you. The Church on Strayer is here to minister hope and help to people. Get in touch with us through the website, call us. Let us know that you need help and we'll be there for you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program Life by Design tonight.